Picture, if you will, a theme park dynasty known for their innovative attractions, with some of their best attractions being adaptations of popular films. While success was achieved with rides based on franchises like Indiana Jones and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, it wouldn't be enough, for the mouse wanted more. In fact, he craved more. And so, rather than making rides based on movies, he decided it was time to make movies based on rides, setting off a bizarre cataclysm of events that we are still feeling the ripples of today. I invite you to take a journey to a strange intersection of theme park attraction and feature film, a reality that could only exist in the Twilight Zone. Hey, I'm in a TV. I'm stuck in a TV. I've gone into the Twilight Zone. I should have listened to Rod Serling all these years. He was always saying you're passing into another dimension. Who listened to him? He was like a skinny guy. While today it seems like Disney only greenlights certain films for their theme park potential, the Disney of the 90s was really inventive in finding new ways to transport the audience into the movies. And naturally, they found a lot of success. And money. Through these film-based attractions. So if movies turned into rides brought Disney success and money, then surely rides turned into movies would also bring them success, and even more money. Starting in 1997, 11 movies based on Disney theme park attractions had been made, with a new one, Jungle Cruise, set to debut later this month. Now excluding the five Pirates of the Caribbean films, which despite their problems have still been enormous hits for Disney, the rest of these movies have all been kind of duds, failing commercially, critically, and even logically. And if making movies based on theme park attractions wasn't enough, I should also point out that Disney actually had a movie renamed to tie into one of their rides. I'm talking about Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. The film was directed and written by Monty Python's Terry Jones, and was originally a standalone adaptation of the Wind in the Willows novel. Disney renamed the movie for American audiences to tie into the theme park ride. This is one I will definitely come back to though, as it's a film I've always had a fondness for, as it has a great cast, featuring several members of Monty Python. One of the best, most original of these adaptations is the one that came first, and it's also the only one actually filmed in the attraction it's based on. Therefore, it's the one I feel is worth exploring first, Tower of Terror. Now, to talk about Tower of Terror the movie, we first have to talk about Tower of Terror the ride. Doesn't anybody work in this place? I'm an important person. What kind of establishment are you running here? I can't believe they- Hey! In the mid-80s, when the then-named Disney's MGM Studios was still in development, Imagineers were torn on how to theme the Sunset Boulevard area of the park. While Dick Tracy and Roger Rabbit-based attractions were considered, Disney CEO Michael Eisner pitched the idea of a Mel Brooks-themed attraction, in the hopes it would lead to Mel making films for Disney. Mel, himself a frequenter of Disneyland, loved the idea. Inspired by the look and feel of young Frankenstein, the ride, to be named Hotel Mel, would take guests on a tour through a supposed haunted Hollywood hotel where Mel was shooting his new movie. Guests would then board golf cart ride vehicles that took them on a tour of the hotel, filled with the type of silly sight gags that populated Mel's films, such as an animatronic Dracula trying to shave in the bathroom mirror despite having no reflection. The project was eventually shelved when Imagineers couldn't figure out how to bring all the different threads of the ride together. But Eisner still loved the idea of a Hollywood-themed haunted hotel. So Imagineers kept the theme, but went in an entirely different direction, deciding to make it a thrill ride, framed as an episode of The Twilight Zone. Rod Serling every week said he unlocked the door to another dimension, to the fifth dimension. So we thought, we'll take you there. This is something he couldn't do. He, he showed stories about this place. But we thought, if we could actually put you in the Twilight Zone, this would be something unique. To this day, I'm so amazed that this ride actually got off the ground, because it has a truly terrifying story at its core. In 1939, a family consisting of a celebrity couple, their child star daughter, Nanny, and a bellhop all perish when they are electrocuted inside their elevator 
when the glamorous Hollywood Tower Hotel is struck by lightning. As the lore goes, the hotel was abandoned, marked by set decorations that suggest decades have passed by. It's also peppered with many Easter eggs from other Twilight Zone episodes. It's one of the most elaborate attraction cues in existence. It's just so eerie and really sets the tone. When crafting their narrative, Imagineers poured through dozens of episodes of the original Twilight Zone show to compile a new intro. Using real footage of Rod Serling mixed with a sound-alike actor for a creepy pre-show video that was directed by Joe Dante. Ready and action! The result is a perfect blend of elements that really puts guests in what feels like a long-lost episode of The Twilight Zone. Brunch, what's up, Hollywood, 1939. Amid the glitz and the glitter of a bustling young movie town at the height of its golden age, the Hollywood Tower Hotel was a star in its own right, a beacon for the show business elite. Now, something is about to happen that will change all that. Wow! A personal invitation from Rod Serling himself! What more can you ask for? Well, maybe a pastrami sandwich, some uh, coleslaw, and a pickle on the side, but we'll have that later on. The ride opened on July 22, 1994, and quickly became a fan favorite, with a version opening in Disneyland in 2004, though it later became a Guardians of the Galaxy themed attraction in 2017, because money. Subsequent versions have since opened at other Disney parks around the world. Because of the ride's success, as well as the fact that it already had an intricate narrative at its core, Eisner believed it would make the perfect pilot production for movies based on Disney park attractions. Unlike the latter attraction-based films, Tower of Terror would be made for television, minimizing the risk while still testing the market. It aired as part of their Wonderful World of Disney series for a special Halloween presentation on October 26, 1997. Because of this, the project was able to remain small in scale, relying more on great character actors and a simple story compared to the later star-studded, special effects-driven theatrical films. The movie was directed and written by DJ McHale, one of the creators of Are You Afraid of the Dark, a show which was heavily influenced by The Twilight Zone. McHale excelled at spearheading bone-chilling yet kid-friendly tales that could be filmed affordably for television, making him a perfect choice to helm Tower of Terror. Unlike the attraction itself, Disney chose not to license the Twilight Zone branding for the movie, though it would still expand upon the ride's lore and characters. The movie centers around a hack tabloid journalist, Buzzy Crocker, played by Steve Gutenberg. How do you think this stuff up? It's a gift. Really strange gift. Who has long been faking his stories for publicity. After being visited by an elderly woman, who claims to have been at the hotel on the infamous night in 1939. I, I try to forget, but every Halloween the stories begin again. It's a curse. I know the truth, but no one believes me. Buzzy decides to investigate the hotel for himself. The movie expands upon the ride's narrative of child star Sally Shine and her family falling victims to a mysterious accident in 1939. A pre-office, Melora Hardin actually plays Sally's mother, and she's just great. Buzzy recruits his niece, Anna, played by Kirsten Dunst, to pose as a ghost for some faked photography. If my friends see this, my life is over. Oh, perfect! You look great! Oh, come on! Beautiful! But Buzzy and Anna quickly get more than they bargain for, when they start to experience unexplainable events at the hotel. Together, they are joined by the hotel's caretaker, Q, played by Michael McShane. Mm, what? Here. W Walnut? No, thanks. In investigating the truth behind the 1939 incident. Being produced on a budget, the movie utilizes the already intricate set that is the Tower of Terror attraction, filming many scenes in and around the attraction itself. I don't think many people realize just how big and elaborate the theming is around the Tower of Terror attraction, but the movie does a great job at utilizing areas that are normally cues for stroller parking or bathrooms. And it helps tie the movie directly to the ride. 
I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and I'm wearing a fuzzy pink bathrobe. While the movie suffers from feeling too TV movie in its style, with many dramatic fades to black for placement of commercials, they also use it to their advantage. Even though it doesn't use the Twilight Zone name, it carries the tone well. It feels much more like an extended episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark than a movie based on a theme park attraction. It's also got elements from The Shining in it, as Buzzy and Anna begin to interact with the ghost guests from the Tower Hotel. When I was alive, there wasn't much I did that turned out right. Pop would have let me run this hotel, but I couldn't even run the elevator. <laughs> its small scale allows the movie to feel like its own thing, while still respecting the ride's theme. It's obvious that Disney gave freedom to the director, resulting in a movie that doesn't take itself too seriously, and really becomes more about the atmosphere and lure than celebrity casting and special effects. The party never ended. We hear it every Halloween. They're waiting for us. But we can't get to it because the elevator's stuck. We tried the stairs, but we can't get past 11. And yes, the movie does end up becoming just a giant commercial for the Tower of Terror ride. But it's still pretty entertaining and unique. This movie genuinely creeped me out as a kid. It nails the tone of the ride and will make you actually want to visit the theme park itself. I mean, shouldn't that have been the aim of all of these attraction-based movies? It's not perfect, but it's the silly type of Disney movie that I'm really nostalgic for. And I loved it as a kid, it didn't try to be too goofy or silly to appeal to me. I mean, Tower of Terror isn't really a ride for little kids anyway. Here's me actually riding for my first time back in 1997. I just wish Disney had made more ride adaptations as one-off TV movies, instead of continuing the trend of celebrity-packed CGI movies that are way too long. I mean, Jungle Cruise is over two hours long. Jungle Cruise, a movie based on this. Now, people have asked me how I landed my job here in the Jungle Cruise. I think it's pretty plain to see. I took a crash course, but now I'm just winging it. At the time I'm making this video, there is a Tower of Terror movie in development with Scarlett Johansson set to star and produce. While I'm hoping it's smaller in scale and compares to the 1997 Tower of Terror movie, I more or less expect it'll be something closer to Jungle Cruise. If Disney really wants to make a new Tower of Terror movie and set it apart from the original, then there's only one person they have to cast to do so. Lightning hits the tower! It smacks into the tower! Thus, plunging the elevator down all the way into oblivion, where the elevator smashed into nothingness! It's just an unrecognizable goop, because it's disgusting! Boy, that must have been terrifying. I'm Gilbert Gottfried. And I'm wearing a fuzzy pink bathrobe.